everyone. Welcome back to the Change Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, Chris Ashley, and I explore the intersection between personal development, spirituality, and science, and I'm excited to have you here today. I'm also really excited to have my guest here today. Laura West is on with me. Hi, I'm Chris. When I was younger, I went through trauma that caused me to feel broken and lost, but my life changed after I had a spiritual awakening. Since then, I've dedicated my life to studying and learning from masters all around the world that have helped me to create a life of fulfillment and abundance beyond my wildest dreams. Now I'm dedicated to sharing everything I've learned so that you don't have to suffer for decades like I did. I've seen people's lives completely transform, and I share it all right here. Laura is a registered nurse, a psychic medium, an author, and a podcast host. So welcome, Laura. I'm I'm really happy you can make the time today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Such a pleasure. Yeah. So, okay, that's that's quite the the bio, right? Registered nurse and then psychic medium. Those things seem really conflicting to a lot of people. Can you talk about what your journey has been like to your, didn't you have a spiritual awakening if I'm not misunderstanding? Yeah, I did. I had a couple. (laughs) So, um, I did, uh, what's, what sort of spearheaded my desire to work in healthcare was when I was a teenager, my grandmother died from uh, cancer <clears throat> and it was like quick, you know, it's like six weeks. She found out she had it four weeks. We were at her funeral sort of thing. It was really fast. Uh, and then that one, we found out she had it. And then six weeks later, we we're at her funeral. I think that didn't make any sense. Okay. I was trying to do the math in my head, but I was like, <laughs> I trust that you know what you're talking about. And I was pregnancy brain. That's so so like, weird. <laughs> I was like something took over my body just then. Okay. Anyway, so what was interesting around that time? So I I was actually going more in the route of journalism. Like I wanted to, I was on like the school newspaper staff and I was going that route. Uh, But when my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer and then, and then died from it, I decided I wanted to go into healthcare. So that's what sort of spearheaded that part of my journey into nursing. Uh, I guess what's kind of interesting, I I never thought about it that way, this way until now, was that it was also my grandmother, same grandmother, who sort of spearheaded my whole journey into mediumship. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. She kind of spearheaded both parts of my journey. So the night that she, uh, passed away, we went to visit her in hospice, uh, that day. And, um, then that night I had a dream that my grandmother came to me, um, in the arm of my grandfather who at the time was alive. And I said, grandma, you're all better. Cause I'd just seen her laying in a, in a bed in hospice, you know, ventilator breathing for her eyes were closed, not there. And, um, I said, grandma, you're all better. And she said, yes, I am. And then it was the next day we found out that she had passed. Well, she had continued to play a role in my journey from then lots of dream visitations and signs and all that good stuff. So, uh, that led me into, uh, I don't know, a couple of years later, I found Sylvia Brown books for the first time. I can't even remember how that came about, but once I did, I couldn't get enough of what Sylvia Brown was teaching. She was a psychic medium who wrote a lot about spirituality of the other side, spirit guides, all these concepts that were new to me, having grown up in a Jewish and Christian household. So, but what, but what I read from her resonated so deeply. And I had my first spiritual awakening then because I just couldn't get enough. I felt like I was awakened to what in my soul felt right. And that's when I met my spirit guide, Jason in a dream and all that good stuff. So that was spiritual awakening number one. And then I did the college thing. I went to nursing school, got married, had children, got a house, like all the human stuff to get nice and grounded and have this nice foundation <laughs> to then have spiritual awakening number two, which happened in 2019. Cause I started meditating and it was there that things just really took off because I learned to hone in on my intuition I learned to follow the intuitive breadcrumbs. I worked very closely with my guides. Uh, My grandmother was there as well. 
And that's what led me to learn what it felt like to be guided to do the next thing, which started off with meditation. Then it turned into channel writing, turned into energy healing, turned into psychic mediumship, turned into writing a book, (laughs) turned into uh, starting a podcast. So I started to follow these breadcrumbs. So from 2019 to now, all of that transpired rather quickly. So I say that spiritual awakening number two happened in 2019. I'm still doing the nursing thing as well. So doing it in conjunction with the spiritual stuff. But to me, even though nursing is very evidence-based in science and uh, and all that, there's still a very human component to it with caring for patients, working with others who are caring for people as well in this environment. And a lot of the times we learn, I learned this in nursing school about that nursing sixth sense, which is intuition. So even in nursing, intuition plays a huge role, just a gut feeling about something. Uh, And then, you know, dealing with a lot of death and, and birth and uh, sickness and, and times in people's lives where uh, they're, they're at their worst or, you know, even at their best, um, having babies and being happy about that. So there's a lot where nursing really allows you to be a part of people's good, bad, ugly. And there's a lot of maybe going back to spirituality for the nurse, for the patient, during those moments. And so I feel like even though nursing is very much set in evidence, like I mentioned before, there is such an intuitive, spiritual, human component to it as well. So a nice balance. Yeah, that's really beautiful. What kind of nurse are you, by the way? I don't know if you mentioned. Yeah. So um, most of my career has been in outpatient uh, working in primary care. Right now, I train other nurses in some of the protocols that we use when triaging patients over the phone. But I would probably say that my specialty really lies in uh, virtual um, like telemedicine. Okay. Um, so, you know, you kind of touched on how you're able to juggle these two different worlds. You know, have you ever found that there's a conflict between Western medicine and the energy healing that you mentioned that you've learned? I think that for me personally, what I loved about energy healing was it allowed me to incorporate and and infuse together my nursing and that healing and energy and spirituality. So I really love the encompassing of both. And with the energy healing, we're healing the, I mean, yeah, you're healing, well, healing, we're helping to improve uh, some of the physical ailments, but a lot of it too is working on the energetic body that we can't see, you know, the aura or the chakras, whatever. And so I feel like that doesn't get addressed so much in the hospital or in the clinics. So for me, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. I mean, I think you said it best, Chris, in your book that we only see 0.035% of the of the light spectrum of the world. Point zero zero three five percent. Oh, point zero. Okay. It's even less. Yeah. So I mean, think about what there's so much we can't see. So, you know, who who is anybody to say that? there's not stuff going on around our bodies as well. So, um, you know, with that knowledge and that open-mindedness and just the circumstantial evidence of doing healing sessions on people or talking to people who've had Reiki or whatever and how they felt improvement. I don't care if it's a placebo effect. effect. If there is improvement, there's, there's improvement. Who's to deny that? So for me, I feel like it really melds the two together. Um, I feel like the hospitals, there's, there's room for improvement there. I know that uh, like a lot of like in the oncology units, they'll have any energy healers come in as volunteers, but I would love to see it incorporated as part of a nurse's role when healing their patients. Yeah, that's really interesting. I was just talking to someone who lives in Canada and she's a healer. She's, she's she does more like physical therapy type stuff, Hmm. but she's coming on my show soon. And I was asking her just in our preliminary call, what do you think about, um, uh, John Sarnos's work? I don't know if you're familiar, but 
he wrote the mind body mm-hmm. prescription mm-hmm. and his whole thing is about how how our repressed emotions always create disease right not all disease is caused by repressed emotions but repressed emotions will always create disease especially unexpressed rage and mm-hmm. he says that he just has to talk about the connection between emotions and illness in his seminars and like half of his audience's pain goes away before he even gets to the exercises to help them but I was asking this woman and she was like her her response like blew me away she was like well you know I have a lot of issues with like the western medical system and like and I was thinking in my head like the western medical system does not incorporate this type of work but apparently in Canada it does and apparently in Canada there's a lot of this where they talk a lot about how repressed emotions and emotions are tied to health. And I was just totally blown away because that's not something that we ever even think about here in the States. So I wonder Mm -hmm. if there's other countries where, you know, there's a lot more incorporation between, you know, the more spiritual sciences and Western medicine. Oh, I'm sure. I'm uh, for sure. Especially the countries that practice Eastern medicine, Uh, you know, right now where we are, we're, I think we're working more towards preventative healthcare, but we still are a lot of treat the disease right. versus prevent the disease or getting to the root cause. So there, there's a lot of work to still be done and to, to be caught up on because I mean, I hate to say it, but uh, even though we're a first world country, our healthcare doesn't exactly reflect that. So uh, totally. So I'm a really big proponent of functional medicine too, because they treat the root cause rather than just the symptoms. There you go. It it seems like Western just covers up the symptoms, but there's so many, so many well-intentioned people in that, in Western medicine, like yourself, who are there to help people, but it's just the system Mm -hmm. trains doctors and a lot of it's run by the pharmaceutical companies and you're kind of locked into what you can do, which leads me to my next question. You know, do you ever use your spiritual gifts or your energy healing on your patients there? And how does that work? Do you ask permission or do you just kind of do it under the... Yeah, good question. So right now, actually, I don't work with patients anymore. It's been a couple of years because I'm more on the admin side now. Uh, But I did have my second spiritual awakening while I was still working in the clinic with patients. Uh, And for me, I actually wanted to (laughs) use my energy healing more for all my colleagues um, over my patients at the time, because it was sort of like an introductory step into bringing it into the workplace. So offering that for the caregivers of those that come in. Um, but I would certainly, uh, it depends on the extent of the, of the healing. I mean, you know, we like to send well wishes to people all the time. We may not be asking them, is it okay if I send you well wishes, right? We just do it. Uh, But if I want to sit down and actually have like a actual more ritualistic session, then uh, yeah, I would want to ask for permission. But if it's like, my hope is that I really hope you get better soon. That to me is just sending a lot of good vibes and energy already. I don't even know if that answered your question, but no, totally. Yeah. And I and I love that you said you want to do it on your colleagues more. I want to hear more about that. Like, how oh they, yeah, were they receptive. Were you like you just yeah. need this, or where did that come from? Yeah. So the colleagues that I spoke to about the the whole thing that I was going through, I would I mean spiritual awakening number two was pretty pretty profound for me. So there were people that I that I would share it with, and. <laughs> I'll be honest, like even some of the physicians as well, like I would, I would talk to them about what I was going through and people were very receptive to it. Uh, and, you know, even offering, um, like sessions for them if they, if they needed it very, very open and, and receptive to it. And I will say that, you know, when I went back for my master's in science degree for nursing, I did a lot of my, uh, research and papers on energy healing. Cause I wanted it to be on something that I was interested in. And so it was really cool to see how a lot of science also backs up the benefits. Like we're talking like scientific nursing journals, um, you know, medical journals as well, backing up the benefits of, of energy healing. And also the benefits of just having a room or a space that maybe has a massage chair or a place where a nurse can go and meditate or do some yoga, um, or like some, you know, positive 
affirmation walls, you know, where they can just kind of get back in that headspace because in nursing, you know, that's a lot of give, 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 give. And even when we get, when we go home to our families, it's give, 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 give. And so to have those moments where we can refill our cups, even if it's just a quarter of the way, um, you know, it's important, I think, to grasp those moments. Yeah. And I love that you brought that up. I know like during the pandemic, everyone was feeling for all the healthcare workers and all the nurses who just, you know, selflessly put themselves out there for like back-to-back shifts. And it was just, they were, they were the heroes, right? Um, so I love that you said science backs it up. And on this podcast, we explore the intersection between science and spirituality. And I know you've read my book. I love backing things up with science. And I don't want to put you on the spot because you probably don't remember all of the things, but were there any that jumped out that you can remember? Like, little things that science backing up this spirituality and this energy healing? I mean, obviously I keep going back to the the, the, the light spectrum of what we can see. I love that. Um, but as far as uh, in my research for yeah. my papers and things, um, just, just, you know, vital signs, vital signs before a, a session um, and then taking the vital signs afterwards and seeing a marked improvement. Mm-hmm. A lot of it too may also be uh, qualitative evidence, such as the nurse saying, I just feel better. Um, it could also lead to improved performance as well. So patients then benefit also. Um, yes, it has been some time, but I do remember that, uh, you know, the doing the before and the after with the, with the, like the, the measurable evidence, like the quantifiable evidence, along with the qualitative evidence to really prove that there was an improvement, a marked improvement in the physical body um, of somebody. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I it, I love that we're getting to the place <clears throat> where science backs up spirituality and mysticism and what all of these ancient cultures have been saying for millennia. You know, it's, it's, we're in a really exciting time to be alive, this age of information, and especially with quantum physics and epigenetics, it just backs up everything. And, and it's, it's, it's contributing to this awakening of humanity that's happening, right? Because some people need that evidence-based information in order to believe, right? Mm -hmm. Even though most of what we see is not, not uh, visible to our to our site, you know, some people need that empirical evidence. Um, okay. So what made you start your podcast? You have uh, a guided life. It's the name of your podcast, right? I was lucky enough to be on it. And you know, what, what prompted that? When did that start in your journey? Mm, Yeah. So, (laughs) um, way back when in the winter of 2021, (laughs) (laughs) I was, starting to get that intuitive nudge to either go blog or podcast route. And I had a, a, a nice conversation with my brother-in-law who had his own podcast and he helped me a lot to really help me see my worth in what I have to share. Cause my whole thing was, well, who's going to want to listen to me? You know, what, what, what is it that I have that's interesting (laughs) for for people? And, you know, is this something I can uh, sustain? Uh, And um, so he helped me to really understand what I have to say is, is valuable. We're sharing and, uh, and having people on as well. So it started off with a very strong intuitive nudge to go one way or the other. What I love about podcasting is that, uh, Unlike blogging, uh, you can hear the expression in people's voice. I think that it feels more intimate for the listener to listen in on a conversation or to be the one that the the host is speaking to. Uh, You can uh, more easily have guests on versus a blog. So I felt that there was a lot more variety in it for me. Uh, and a way for me to connect better with uh, others who are also interested in the stuff that I am, whether they come on as guests or they're just listening. And I mean, I was just grateful to have even one person listen, but I've been so lucky to be in the thousands and in the top 10% globally. So I'm heading in the right direction. Um, 
so that it really the intuitive nudge to to do something next and more and it's just been a fantastic ride i've i mean i started last march march of 2022 and um been going weekly ever since and i absolutely love it yeah that's awesome and i think what you said is so important that there's so many people out there who they want to try something, right? They have a message they want to get across. They have an interest, whether it's posting online or speaking somewhere or starting a podcast. And they look out there and they're like, well, wait, there's so many other people doing this, right? Like, who am I? But if you have a message to share, if you have a story to share, someone's going to resonate with it, you know? And, and I, so I used to run a yoga teacher training and I would tell my trainees this all the time. Like, don't reinvent the wheel, like use the same cues for warrior one. And someone might have come to 500 yoga classes and heard that same cue, but then the way you say it is different. And it just like resonates with that person, it just like locks into place. So, you know, everyone, everyone's voice is unique and everyone has a unique message and someone's going to resonate with you more than everyone else out there. So I love good on your brother-in-law for talking you into it. <laughs> we can yeah, all thank, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so, it's so, so important. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned very briefly kind of waved over this, that you have a spirit guide named Jason. So <laughs> we need to hear about Jason. Tell us about Jason. Oh, Jason would love to be uh, talked about. <laughs> um, so Jason, uh, we met uh, back when I was a teenager or, yeah, teenager soon after finding Sylvia Brown books. And she talked about how we all have a spirit guide. And that was a brand new concept to me because Christianity never talked about that. Judaism never talked about that. So I was like, what? So I, I couldn't wait to meet mine. But I was like, I do not want him like jumping out of a corner or something that's going <laughs> to scare the crap out of me. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, so I'm going to follow what Sylvia Brown said and ask for my spirit guide, if I have one to meet me in my dreams. Mm. And so I did that. And I would say probably a couple of weeks later, it was not a very exciting dream, but you know, I'm in this sort of dark space and there's these geometric shapes on the ground and like almost like these logs and sticks on the ground. I don't even, I don't even know. It's just, I can see the shapes and I see this man standing there, young man, like in his twenties, and he's sort of floating <laughs> above these logs. And I don't know if anybody who has seen the Indian in the cupboard that came out like in the nineties, he that. looks like, the, <laughs> Oh, do you? It's such a good book. Anyway. So the, in the movie, the little boy, he looks like that, but as a, like a 20 year old man, Funny. And so, but I just, when I saw him, I just knew, I'm so glad I knew, like my mind knew to ask, are you my spirit guide? And he said, yes. And then the next question I happened to ask was, what is your name? And he told me Jason. And that was it. That was the end of the dream. Um, but so that's how I met him. And that's how, how I knew his name. And so, you know, I didn't really do anything with that. It was kind of like, oh, okay. And then, but I don't even know if I knew what to do with that. I mean, I'm assuming Sylvia Brown must have said it in one of her books, but I don't remember doing much more with that. And then, and, you know, life happened, all this stuff. And then fast forward to 2019. And I always knew he was there. I would think about him every once in a while. But, uh, I, you know, I, re I really think in 2019, he says, all right, it's, it's time. <laughs> it's time to do and start what, you know, what you came here to do. And so, uh, that's when the intuitive nudges started coming to, um, start meditating, which I never did before because I was scared again, uh, that if I meditated, my soul would leave and I would get possessed <laughs> by something else. I just had these crazy ideas or meditation wasn't for me because I wasn't a Buddhist monk. And I, you know, I can't sit Lotus position on, top of a hill for two hours. I don't have time for that. So meditation just didn't really feel quick, like for where, me. where do you think yeah. those like fear thoughts came from? Was that from like religious upbringing? Do you think? <laughs> no. or... Um, maybe. Okay. That's a good question. I never thought about that. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I've, I've heard the second one, but I've never heard the first one. It's like a very specific fear. Yeah. Of being possessed. But what's funny mm -hmm. is that I've brought this up to other guests that I've had on my show and they're like, me too. So, so other people have had the same. 
Yeah. I don't know. Maybe just me. Who knows? So anyway, <laughs> never happened. Never will. <laughs> um, and then that just the 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 meditation. What it did was it like it just opened up something where I was able to receive guidance from him and whoever else on my team, maybe more, more directly, uh, not so much like intuitive hunches anymore. Now it was more like, Oh, okay. It was just more obvious. Uh, and then I really dived into spirituality and I dive, I dived in, I dove into spirituality and I dove into, practicing, you know, channel writing and mediumship and all this energy healing, it all helped me to create a, a stronger communicative relationship with him uh, that I have since continued to strengthen so that now I just, I can tell when he's here or when I get a, a hit from him, I know that it's him versus um, me or, or whatever. So Anyway, uh, yeah, that's that's how I met Jason and how Jason still come to be. I consider him my quote unquote main guide. Um, I do have other guides. I met another guide the same way that I met him was through a dream with those two very simple questions and um, still trying to figure out what her purpose in my life is for. Her name's Lana. But uh, yeah, so that's who Jason is in a nutshell. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for sharing. And thanks for sharing how easy it was for you to connect with him because I'm sure listeners are like, how, how do I meet my spirit guide? And we all have spirit guides. We all, like you said, you have a team, right? There are, there are souls, beings on the other side of the veil who are here to help us, but they can't interfere. We have to ask for their help, right? They can't just tell us to turn right on the street, right? Like we have to ask for that. So if you want to connect with them, you know, ask to connect with them in a dream like uh, Laura did. I love that so much. So, yeah. so then, okay. So you also learned mediumship. Was that something you went somewhere to train for or did it develop naturally or how did that come about? Good question. So a lot of spiritual awakening number two, which involved learning mediumship happened during COVID. So it was all virtual. Uh, and in, I had always had an interest in mediumship. I always enjoyed watching mediums on TV, John Edwards, Teresa Caputo, whoever. I always enjoyed that. And I always would cry these, you know, ugly, ugly cries when I would, when I would see them, you know, making these connections for people, uh, loved the show, um, the ghost whisper with Jennifer Love Hewitt. That show was amazing. And I cried every episode too, even though it wasn't real, but still it like hit, hit a nerve. Yeah. <laughs> and so I always loved the idea of connecting to spirit, not in a scary way, but in a very loving way. And I would have dreams. It would be in my dreams where I would get messages from people who have passed, uh, where I would get visitations from people who have passed, whether they were family members, uh, friends, family of friends. So I would get visitations. And, and so all these events would happen that now in retrospect, I realize we're setting me up for my road to mediumship. Mm -hmm. So in 2019, when I started to do all the stuff, the channel writing, energy healing and everything like that, working very really closely with Jason, I felt comfortable exploring mediumship <laughs> because again, I'm a scaredy cat. <laughs> I was worried that if I opened that door, then I would start seeing ghosts or like scary things would come in. <laughs> So, so I, I took it really slow and I made sure that Jason was there with me when I would do, when I would connect to people who passed. And what I learned was, was that it was very similar to how I already connected with entities on the other side, loving entities on the other side. Cause I already set that intention of it being, you know, of a highest, best good. And so it became so much less scary when I realized, oh, it's still in my mind's eye. Like it's. So I would, I would actually love to see them with my real eyes. Now I've come a long way, uh, but I realize it's still, you know, it's in my mind's eye, so it's all good. Um, so that's how I was able to sort of start that journey of, of mediumship because I wanted to be awake and I wanted to be more in control of when those encounters happen versus, oh, I just had a random dream last night. So 
Yeah, totally. And I think a lot of people can relate to getting visitations and dreams. I mean, I certainly can relate to that. I, I get visited by family members who have passed all the time. And, you know, I think anyone is probably capable of these gifts, right? Like humans only use 10% of their brain or something. It's just a matter of honing it, right? And and having that intention and probably also letting go of that fear. I, I just had uh, spirit medium Daniel Jackson on my show a few episodes ago, and he sees all the scary stuff. So it's definitely a possibility. <laughs> so it's good that it's good that you set that intention and that boundary for yourself. I think that's really important. Um, so what do you do with the mediumship now? Are you out there helping people? Are you, or is it just kind of for you? Yeah. So um, I do do readings for people. Uh, I really enjoy it. I, I like to focus a lot on connecting with people's spirit guides. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if family members come through, or if somebody wants to hear from a family member you know, I'm happy to, happy to do it. Uh, so yeah, I do offer readings for people. That's cool. So when you connect people with their spirit guides, what does that look like? Do you, oh. yeah, yeah. Tell me. Okay. Oh, it's so, it's right so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Um, so for me, when I am, I call it, we call it sitting in the power where you sort of getting into that mental space of preparing to connect. I like to do it before I get on the um, call with the, with the client or with the sitter. Um, and, you know, we'll do it over zoom or some sort of virtual setting. And usually I can tell when the guides are there and ready to go or whoever else is there ready to go, because I, I can picture myself sitting in a chair across from my sitter and to their left, they're holding hands with a, um, with a being <laughs> and they're sort of like, their, their head is sort of resting on their hands that, the, that are being held mm -hmm. together. And so to me, I'm like, okay, we're connected guides here. <clears throat> um, family members come in usually wearing white and they are usually off a little bit. They're not holding hands with the client. And I think it's because for the most part, the client isn't expecting them to be there because usually when they book a reading with me, it's to connect with, with their guides. So their guides, they're ready. Um, whereas the family members there, but the family members always cannot wait to send a message. So I always let them go first. The guides are very generous to let them go first. Um, because they are like, bursting at the seams to, to finally talk to their loved one. And then once their message is done, then we can address what the guides want to share. Uh, I, if there are other entities as well, they usually show up on the, on the right side of the client as they're sitting in the chair. I once had the goddess of astrology standing there and I didn't know that's who it was at first until we started talking more about this being. And then I realized it just like came into my head. Oh my gosh, it's the goddess of astrology. Technology. didn't even know she existed, but here she is. Yeah. Uh, and it was really cool because uh, for that, for that session, the clients, all her questions were related to astrology. So it was mm. so cool. Like I didn't know. It was and relevant. So it's, okay. Yeah. Totally relevant. So it was really cool. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, that's, that's what it looks like. And then once I've established that we're there, I've created this nice bubble of, of protection and love. And then, um, then we start the reading and I just, word vomit on the person, <laughs> all the messages <laughs> that the person has been, you know, needing to hear from whoever is on the other side, you know, hoping that we address their questions. And if we don't, then we can get to them for sure. But that's how, that's how we like to do it. I like to do it. Yeah, that's really cool. So it, are you ever, do you ever have like psychic abilities? Like, could you ever be looking at someone and see spirits around them or see their spirit guides or family, or does it always have to be this, this set up ritualistic kind of experience? No, I can tune in right away and just say like, I want, like, I wonder who, you know, who would come through for Chris and right away. I'm like, Oh, there's this elderly gentleman, like to her right. And he looks like a grandpa to me. So like, that's who would, that's what I do. I just have to sort of flip a switch and tune in <laughs> and like, sort of like move my focus to, to that. I don't know why I'm whipping my head around like that, but so like, I, that's how I, I do. If I, if I can, you know, instead of focusing on, uh, I don't know, like I'm reading a book, uh, and then I want to see like, oh, there's the TV's on what's, you know, what, I wonder what the person's watching, like, it's kind of like turning my focus that way. So that's how, that's how I do it. That makes sense. It's like, you're tuning into this other 
dimension or this other realm in a way. Yeah, I so like how you say it that way. Standing, is there actually someone standing next to me right now? Yeah, so as soon as I said, oh, like I wonder who would come in for Chris, that um, elderly gentleman, I know he's bald with a, must, with a mustache, but maybe that's to show grandpa, I don't know. And he's hmm. got glasses as well. Anyway, I see him to your right. Interesting. I don't know. But that am I? Am, oh, sorry. Your left. My left. My oh, because eye. it's it's weird with Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. I'm glad he's here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He does feel like family members, so maybe ask your ask your family. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. I. <laughs> I've had another medium on tell me that someone was here, and it was like some woman. I think her name was Catherine with curly hair. And he described this person in like great detail that I had never heard of before in my life. And he was like, well, she's your great, 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 great grandmother. Of course I'm never like, okay. I don't know who that person is. Yeah. I was like, I believe you, but I have no idea. Yeah. I can't validate. That's hard to validate. Yeah. This doesn't feel so far removed. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I wonder who it is. Um, okay. So, you know, just I want to bring it back around to the the nursing and the Western medicine, because I think that's what's super fascinating also. Like, is there anything that you can leave people with in terms of any advice if people are trying to figure out what they want to do with their healthcare, what they want, like how these things intersect, Mm -hmm. if they're trying to juggle how these things intersect, um, especially in the day and age when, you know, COVID shots are still a thing or just post-pandemic, like how do people juggle that spiritual healing versus Western medicine? Yeah. So I think that it's, it's nice to not have, not have to do one or the other. Mm -hmm. I think that encompassing them both together can be really beneficial because Western medicine really addresses the physical body. Energy healing addresses the energetic body. Uh, So being able to address both, um, I think can really benefit a person and you know whether or not uh you believe it because you can't see it uh you know skepticism is healthy to a point uh, but not Mm -hmm. if it closes you off completely uh but you know if it doesn't hurt uh having an energy session and can be very relaxing and so if anything at least you've gotten some time to relax and let your body sort of slow down and do what it needs to and the perk you know you get you get uh added a energy healing that you may not even realize you needed. Um, so anyway, I think that the biggest thing is to, is to, again, have a healthy skepticism, but don't rule it out completely. Um, and to, to give it a try before you decide that it's, that it's not for you. Um, but at the same time, it wouldn't hurt anything if it, if it wasn't for you. So I think that it's important to meld the, meld the two. I like that a lot. And I think in the spiritual community, there's almost this looking down on people who do get Western medicine. And I just want to say to to listeners, I don't think it makes you any less spiritual if you go to a hospital or you go to a Western doctor. There's there's this great story from Vishen Lakshiani, who is the founder of Mind Valley, where he wanted to fix his eyesight. And he was meditating on it and he was meditating on it and he was, he was doing, he, he teaches Jose Silva's method. So he was using like his internal vision and he just wanted it to happen so bad for months and nothing was working. And then he walked outside his apartment one day and they had just put up this huge billboard for LASIK surgery. And he was like, well, that was the sign from the universe. (laughs) It was like, here's how you're going to fix your eyesight. And I just love that so much because it's like, sometimes that is the answer. I mean, we're still physical bodies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. I think I think that wraps it up. We're still physical bodies. We're still having this human experience. And if you break your arm, you need to go to the ER. <laughs> um, but uh, energy healing, yeah. yeah. Energy so healing might, of... sorry, go ahead. No, go, go for it. I was just going to say energy healing might maybe help hasten the healing process, but you still need someone to go in there and put it back together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So yeah, I, I like that. Have a healthy amount of skepticism, but don't let it hold you back. And you can do both and it it doesn't make you any less of a person. So awesome. Um, well, I'm so glad you came on. Can you tell listeners how they can get in touch with you or if they want to work with you or listen to you? Where do they go? Yeah, I have everything on um, a link tree. So it's super easy to 
find, uh, you know, my website or how to get in touch with me or how to, to book anything or to find the um, podcast. So it's just link tree. So L I N K T R dot E E forward slash guided West. Okay. And I love that actually, cause it's the guided life, but your last name, that's actually really, really oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, Thank that's you. good. I like what you did there. Um, I'm going to put it in the show notes too. I think you sent it to me. If you didn't, we'll, I'll get it after the show. So if you're driving and listening to this or not in a place where you can write it down, um, it'll be in the show notes. And thank you so much for coming on, Laura. I, I loved our conversation and I was on your show and I loved talking to you then and I just wanted to continue it. So thanks for coming on. Uh, for everyone else, please listen, subscribe, share this episode, help spread the good vibes. We can help awaken the planet. Uh, check out my book, Change Your Mind to Change Your Reality. The links are in the show notes as well. And have a beautiful rest of your day.